Hello, I'm Sean Mullally and welcome back to Muskegon in Motion. I'm joined today by John McGrary, who is CEO of the Lakeshore Museum Center. Thank you for having us. Well, Sean, welcome. We're glad to have you here. Absolutely. Tell us uh, a little bit about uh, what, what your role is with uh, the museum and, and your background. Well, Sean, uh, I am the CEO, Chief Executive Officer of the uh, Lakeshore Museum Center. Mm -hmm. So I'm the uh, person that's um, uh, the liaison to the Board of Trustees, uh, okay. which manages the museum. I oversee the staff, develop the budget, do a lot of paperwork, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, try to engage with the public. I do a lot of public speaking, mm -hmm. uh, fundraising, uh, but I also uh, I'm also a historian, so I get to work on historical projects. Uh, occasionally I get to be a, a, a project officer for uh, exhibits, and I try mm -hmm. to work with the, uh, the staff uh, to provide training opportunities for them and mm -hmm. to, uh, to kind of create a vision of where we might take the museum in the future. Okay. Now, Muskegon is fortunate in having a number of museums, each with their own focus. Tell us what's the mission of the, the Lakeshore Museum Center in particular. Well, the mission of the Lakeshore Museum Center is to interpret and preserve the natural and cultural history of Muskegon County. Uh, mm -hmm. And we've actually expanded that a bit because um, uh, we're actually, uh, along the Lakeshore, the largest cultural institution uh, mm -hmm. dealing with uh, history, natural and cultural. And uh, so we're really working with the history of, of West Michigan, but in particular Muskegon County. Okay. And aside from the, the museum proper here, where we're mm -hmm. sitting today, um, you've got some, some other adventures. You've got uh, Hackley Hume Homes that mm -hmm. you're responsible for. Um, a few other uh, off-site things. Why don't you tell us some about those? Well, I think when people begin investigating the Lakeshore Museum Center, they're, they're surprised at the breadth and the scope of, of what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, we do operate the main museum here at uh, the corner of 4th and Clay. This is mm -hmm. where we have our exhibition galleries and our administrative uh, headquarters. We also operate, uh, have restored and operate uh, the uh, Hackley and Hume Historic Site. Mm -hmm. We also have the Skolnick House of the Depression Era, mm -hmm. the Fire Barn Museum. Uh, we have a public archives uh, featuring thousands of photographs, tens of thousands actually, and uh, documents mm -hmm. uh, that's open to public researchers. That's located uh, down on uh, Western Avenue. So it's mm -hmm. a, a pretty comprehensive program. Okay. Now one thing I'd like to hear more about is what's going on with the, uh, the Heritage Park that is being developed? Well, uh, about five years ago we were approached by um, uh, a group of people that were interested in having the Lakeshore Museum Center get involved in the development of a, a beautiful piece of property up in the Whitehall Montague area. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, over time we did feasibility studies and uh, decided that the, uh, the best use of a small portion of the property uh, mm -hmm. would be the development of Michigan's Heritage Park. Mm -hmm. Our goal is to create a center where people will be able to take a walk through uh, the beauty of West Michigan's woodlands mm -hmm. and uh, to experience, and that's an important part of what we're yeah. attempting to do there, to experience 10,000 years of uh, Michigan history. They'll encounter uh, a mastodon dig, a, a mm. full-sized Ottawa Indian village, mm -hmm. uh, a Hopewell uh, burial mound, French fur traders cabin, uh, Civil War camp, uh, we're going to have a turn-of-the-century farmhouse, uh, CCC mm -hmm. camp. It's going to be a total immersive uh, event and rather than just coming up on a static display, you're going to be able to interact with history. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the kids will be churning butter, oh, uh, we'll be <laughs> sitting down and talking with Civil War soldiers, uh, uh, stacking logs with men of the CCC. and. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, we see this as, as a two-pronged project. One, it'll be a perfect learning laboratory for uh, students, young and old. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we see it as a major uh, tourist attraction. Uh, we believe that uh, good history can be good business for mm -hmm. a community. And so we think that we're going to have a major impact on tourism throughout Muskegon County. Now this is a work in progress at the moment. Right? It is. Mm -hmm. uh, as I say, we started work on it in about 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, we started active construction uh, last fall 
And uh, if I could take you up there this afternoon, you'd see that the uh, carpenters are driving nails, the roofs are going on mm -hmm. as we speak, and uh, we have uh, a busy construction schedule throughout the rest of 2014. Uh, and our goal, uh, and I'm quite certain we're going to meet it, is that we'll have the grand opening in May of 2015. That's so that's cool. just about a year away. Now you mentioned uh, you mentioned students getting involved. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about uh, about some of how you outreach to, to to local schools or bring them in to experience what you have here. Well, education is really at the heart of everything we do. Mm -hmm. um, for um, uh, for every program, for every project we do, we work with uh, local teachers and in particular the curriculum development specialists at the uh, Muskegon Area ISD. And uh, all of our programs match the core curriculum, match the, the uh, they've gone through a number of names, the GLICs, the, the MEEP standards, and so on. Uh, but we try to present programs that are mission appropriate, mm -hmm. uh, that meet what the classroom teachers need. Mm -hmm. um, pioneer living uh, programs on rocks and fossils, uh, natural history topics, and so on. Um, and as a result, the school systems have really embraced us. Uh, we serve every school district in um, Muskegon County. And on an average basis, we serve about 24,000 school children a year wow. uh, in formal programs. Uh, and that's, uh, that's where the schools are coming in and taking part in a program. Uh, we send uh, some of our education staff out into the schools. We have loan kits with um, uh, lesson plans and materials. Uh, mm -hmm. We developed a very active program about uh, three years ago for homeschoolers. And that, uh, that's a program that's exploded in popularity. So mm -hmm. we're really trying to use the resources that we have here in the museum, the resources mm -hmm. being people, artifacts, and information, to present the things that the kids need to learn. Excellent. Now, if members of the public want to come to the museum mm -hmm. here, um, location, hours, uh, admission? The uh, main museum is open seven days a week. That's okay. located at 4th and Clay. Mm -hmm. uh, we're open Monday through Friday from uh, 10 to 4.30. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, on weekends, we're open from 12 to 4. Mm -hmm. Our historic sites in the southern division, that's Skolnick, Hackley and Hume, the fire barn, mm -hmm. they're open from the first uh, Wednesday in May uh, through the end of October. And they're open Wednesday through Sunday from 12 to 4. Okay. That's kind of a lot for your viewers to remember. Right. I'd strongly <laughs> encourage if anybody wants to know what our programs are that's going on uh, or our hours of operation or what's the newest exhibit we have, the mm -hmm. easiest way is to go to our website, mm -hmm. and that's Lakeshore Museum, all one word, lakeshoremuseum.org. And mm -hmm. it's all laid out there. Great. Well, I'm uh, eager to see some of the exhibits you've got on site here. Would you mind giving us a look? It would be an honor. Let's go take a walk. All right. Thank All you. Right. All right, John, I think this is one of your, one of your newest uh, exhibits. What are we looking at here? Well, Sean, right now we're in our temporary gallery here at the uh, main building at 4th and Clay. Mm -hmm. And uh, our current offering as a temporary exhibition is the Fossils of the Michigan Basin. Mm -hmm. Remember, again, we're natural history as well as cultural history. Mm -hmm. So we do lumbering and Native, American, and Native Americans, but we also do the rocks, minerals, and, and fossils. Mm -hmm. And this is a, uh, an exhibit that we have uh, brought in that shows the wonderful wealth of fossils that mm -hmm. can be found uh, right here in, uh, in Michigan. And a lot of people don't really think of this area uh, and how it developed, mm -hmm. but we have a rich fossil history here mm -hmm. that, that people are unaware of. Mm -hmm. uh, I can give you an example, all right? Uh, right here in front of us is um, a uh, limestone formation from about 600 uh, million years ago. This is a fossil called Hexagonaria. Okay. Okay, it looks kind of like if you're a diver, mm -hmm. uh, it kind of looks like a brain coral. It does. All right. Mm -hmm. what, what do you call that? I don't know that I could pronounce that. But <laughs> well, well, actually, you're very familiar with it because that's a Petoskey stone. Oh, yeah, in its raw form. That's where the Petoskey stone comes from. 600 mm -hmm. million years ago, 
all of West Michigan was a shallow saltwater sea, mm -hmm. and there was all kinds of coral, cephalopods, uh, brachiopods, all kinds of, of creatures around here. And they've left a fossil record that uh, we find on the beaches today. Now, when it comes to making education memorable for students, mm -hmm. I don't think anything beats your Body Works exhibit. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's, let's hope. Let's hope that uh, we're, we're hitting to the heart of the memory of young minds. Mm -hmm. This, uh, uh, Sean, is a perfect example of how the Lakeshore Museum Center develops the concepts and ideas. Uh, mm -hmm. When it was time to remodel this exhibit gallery, Mm -hmm. uh, we, which is supported, by the way, by the Muskegon County Medical Alliance. Okay. Uh, we brought together a comprehensive team from throughout the community. And uh, what we found in asking what, what is it that the community needs us to, to work on mm -hmm. is that there needed to be a place where we could bring in young students, mm -hmm. elementary school children, and talk to them about the choices that they make and how mm -hmm. critically important those choices are because of the, the health issues that we're having. Mm -hmm. um, uh, obesity, uh, young people getting diabetes and so mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. And so this whole exhibit walks young people through how to make healthy choices. Mm -hmm. and, and it's very exciting to me. One of the reasons I love the museum business is that like a library, like a school, we're an mm -hmm. educational institution, but we educate with things, mm -hmm. all right? And so, you know, you can lecture uh, a, a yeah. third grader on and on and on, but if you bring them in and show them something like this, yeah, show them <laughs> this model and say, if you chew tobacco, this is what <laughs> your mouth's going to look like. It's a, a vehicle for learning that, <laughs> that works very, very powerfully. Mm -hmm. Anything they can get their, their hands involved with and, exactly. and do interactive is, is very helpful. And I see a lot of that around here. That's, that's the whole idea in here. John, tell us a little bit about the passenger pigeon. Well, Sean, as we, as we move downstairs, I wanted to mm -hmm. take just a moment and tell you about this project that, that I'm very, very proud that we're a part of. Mm -hmm. uh, 2014 marks the 100th anniversary of the death of the last passenger pigeon. Mm -hmm. Uh, these were once so common that here in West Michigan the sky would turn black. Mm -hmm. But they were harvested uh, for squab. It became the in mm -hmm. thing to eat in the 1890s and around 1900. Mm -hmm. uh, it was one of the first true extinction crises that, that environmentalists uh, began to look at. And so uh, 2014 is uh, Project Passenger Pigeon, or P3 as it's become known. Mm -hmm. It's a nationwide project. And because we have the, uh, one of the few stuffed passenger pigeons and this beautiful painting that's up here above you, this was done by local artist Lewis Cross. Very striking. Uh, isn't it gorgeous? Mm -hmm. uh, we were asked to, uh, to be uh, one of the featured sites of the Passenger Pigeon Project. And this painting is actually being used in the documentary, the mm -hmm. national documentary that's being produced for PBS. Right now, Sean, we're down in a permanent exhibit called Michigan Through the Depths of Time. Okay. This again comes back to our natural history mission, and we're literally talking how Muskegon County was formed. Upstairs mm -hmm. in the temporary gallery, mm -hmm. I, I showed you, or I discussed with you that uh, 600 million years ago, mm -hmm. this area was covered in water. And that's what we're displaying down here, some of the same artifacts that are in the temporary gallery. What's important for you to understand is, again, how the concept for this exhibit was developed. Mm -hmm. One of the things that they're really pushing in the school systems now is for students to be able to work with primary documents, mm -hmm. primary information, and then to translate that into concepts and ideals. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, we have a representation of what that shallow sea looked like. Mm -hmm. Over here, we have the original artifacts. Mm -hmm. As part of our educational programming, the students go back and forth. They yeah. use the original artifact to put it in context, and then they have to write up a description of what it is they've discovered. It's a fun way to learn. It also fits in directly with the curriculum needs of the school systems. That's why our programs are so popular and why we have schools from throughout West Michigan coming here to Muskegon County to visit us. Well, John, we fast forwarded in time a little bit. We're, we're standing on land now. We're, we've moved up about 300 million years. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we're now in the period of time when the land is beginning to dry out mm -hmm. and we have these huge uh, uh, organic growth coming up out of a wet, moist soil. Mm -hmm. And and this material, it's not really trees as we have them today, but they'll go 80 to 100 feet tall. And over time, this material will collapse into the mud. And when it does, that's going to create the oil and natural gas deposits mm. that we have here in West Michigan. Fossil fuels. Fossil fuels, absolutely. <laughs> Well, when, when students come through this gallery, they always want to know, where's the dinosaurs? Mm -hmm. And when we take a look at the historical record of the United States, mm -hmm. we know that dinosaur fossils are found in all the regions around Michigan. So there's no reason to believe they didn't exist here. But mm -hmm. why aren't they here? Well, it's the next epoch that we're going to see, the glaciers. And mm -hmm. those glaciers were so big and so deep that they came in and just scoured everything clean. Mm. And so we believe that they wiped off the fossil record of oh. the dinosaurs. So my challenge to the students out there is go into science, yeah. become a paleontologist, you might be the first one to find <laughs> a dinosaur in Michigan. Wow. <laughs> Speaking of glaciers, we seem to have found them. About two million years ago, uh, the ice began to form and the glaciers began to creep down from the north. Mm -hmm. There were places in the lower Michigan Peninsula where the ice was over a mile thick. Mm. And uh, it was in constant motion. So that's that grinding action that took off the dinosaur record. It also, in grinding everything up underneath it, mm -hmm. left uh, the most predominant soil that we have, which is sand. The sand on the beaches, even in your yard and my yard, if you mm -hmm. reach down and grab a handful of dirt, it's mostly made out of sand, and that's because of this ice. So that's what we have to thank for our nice beaches. Absolutely. Great. <laughs> now this big guy must be a hit with the kids. Oh, they love him. <laughs> they love him. This is a model of the giant beaver. About 10,000 years ago, those glaciers began to recede. Mm -hmm. And as you can see in this diorama, what was left behind was a, was a beautiful tundra-like existence. And that sandy, moist soil was the perfect growing medium for pine trees. Mm. And so a number of large mammals, like the giant beaver, the mastodon, the woolly mammoth, moved into the area. Mm -hmm. What's important about that, and you can see our mastodon bones over here in this case, Mm -hmm. uh, was that the very first evidence of human occupation of the mm -hmm. area comes at this time. And we believe they came into the area to mm -hmm. begin hunting the mastodons, which would be a big hunk of steak. That's a, that's a big meal right there. A big meal. <laughs> well, now things are starting to look a little bit more familiar around us. Well, hopefully, hopefully so. This, after all those millions of years, we end up with West Michigan as we know it now. Mm -hmm. And this is our habitat gallery mm -hmm. where we show the five types of habitat we have in Muskegon County. Mm -hmm. We start with the dunes, the wetlands, the grasslands, the woods, and even the ur urban environment, which mm -hmm. is an ecosystem yeah. and one that's changing as more and more animals adapt into it. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, coming back to the curriculum, the teachers have told us that uh, one part of the curriculum they have trouble teaching in the classroom is uh, food webs, interdependencies, um, uh, producers and consumers, and this whole gallery is set up to aid in teaching those subjects and those portions of the curriculum. Okay. Well, John, as the son of a science teacher, I got to say we just uh, came into probably my most favorite part. <laughs> oh, good. Well, we're now in the science gallery. Mm -hmm. And again, years ago, the ISD came to me and said, we need a facility in which we can teach physical science. So we've expanded on our natural history mission to include physics and, and science. Mm -hmm. And again, we try to do that in a hands-on way, providing materials that teachers can show uh, very complex concepts um, Mm -hmm. in an easy manner. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is one of my favorite examples right here. Mm -hmm. This is an example of uh, pulleys, uh, which is one of the, the uh, six simple tools, uh, mm -hmm. but there's a deeper concept that we try to teach here. Mm -hmm. We have a single, double, and triple pulley. Give each mm -hmm. one of them a to pull and, and, and see which one you think is easiest to lift. That one you're pulling all 28 pounds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's that's a little better. 
And over here, I think even the youngest kids would probably not have too hard a time. <laughs> well, single, double, and triple pulley. The triple pulley definitely makes it easier. But mm -hmm. here's a complex question. Mm -hmm. Which one of these uses the most energy? Which one takes the more, most horsepower to lift that weight? Well, I think the easy answer is uh, this one's the easiest. This one takes the most work, but I think the right answer is they're all the same. They're all the same. You got it. <laughs> you, you learned something from your science teacher father. Absolutely. They all use the same thing. What we're doing is we're moving 28 pounds, approximately three feet. Mm -hmm. And the definition of horsepower is the amount of energy consumed to move a certain amount of weight a certain distance. Mm -hmm. Here, while it's easier, it takes much more time. Yep. So that's a concept that's very difficult even for adults to process, mm -hmm. but once they go through this, the light bulbs go on. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Now earlier, John, you said that we haven't found any dinosaur fossils yet in Michigan. How about the mastodon that we're looking at here? Well, mastodon bones have actually been found throughout the uh, lower peninsula. Uh, mm -hmm. And in particular here in Muskegon County in 1905, there was some mastodon bones found out by Ravenna. Oh. And what's important about that find is mm -hmm. that the uh, bones had been separated, uh, the head was found disjointed from the body, and we believe mm -hmm. that that would signify the beginning of human occupation of Muskegon County in West Michigan. Somebody so had we, to have done it. If somebody had to had to take it apart, and there wasn't it, there weren't any animals big enough around uh, meat eating animals to do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So we take that as the beginning of human occupation, and we use the mastodon as kind of a symbol then between the natural and the cultural history. Mm -hmm. And that's why here in our coming to the lakes, which is the story of the people of Muskegon County, mm -hmm. this is the first thing that you see. Now, John, this looks like a wigwam. Uh, it, this is. This is a recreation of what the uh, uh, people of uh, uh, Muskegon County were living in when uh, they made first contact with the Europeans. Mm -hmm. Those people that came here to hunt the mastodon mm -hmm. to, uh, eight, nine, ten thousand years ago, over time developed different cultural affinities. Mm -hmm. And by the time the first the Europeans arrived, the people, the aboriginal people living here were the Ottawa, Potawatomi and Chippewa, which collectively we know as the Anishabi, mm. or the people of the three fires. Across from it, we show what would be the first a European type of uh, structure. Mm -hmm. This is a French fur trader's cabin. Uh, the French moved into this area fairly early, right after uh, almost within 150 years, 200 years of the founding of North America, and began trading with the Native Americans for uh, beaver fur. Mm -hmm. uh, the beaver fur was used in the production of felt hats, and of course that was the height of fashion in Europe at the mm -hmm. time. So they were almost worth their weight in gold. <laughs> yeah. And now it looks like we're into the lumbering era. That's correct. Mm -hmm. In 1836, the federal government signed a treaty with the Native Americans living in this area, and that opened up the last section, the strip of land along the coastline of Michigan. Mm -hmm. When that happened, then Europeans began swarming into the area. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily to live here. It was mm -hmm. very wet. Um, malaria was a major problem. Mm -hmm. They called it Michigan fever. But it had one commodity that the entire United States needed, and that was an abundance of pine trees. Again, going back to that sandy soil from yeah. the glaciers. Uh, perfect habitat for white pine. Mm -hmm. White pine's also then the perfect building material at a time when the United States is exploding in growth. Mm -hmm. And as a result, as they moved in, they were buying up track lands of, of uh, 80 acre sections, which yeah. is still how we measure things here, and uh, harvesting this white pine. Mm -hmm. And they were literally printing money uh, at that time, you could buy an 80-acre section for about $125. Wow. After you cut the lumber, brought it down the Muskegon River, sawed it in a mill here on Muskegon Lake, and took mm -hmm. it to Chicago, that $125 would net about $5,000 in profit. A, so lot of, it was, a lot of fortunes made during that time. Well, we think that there may have been, uh, by 1870, 1880, as many as 40 millionaires created here in Muskegon City.
Well, John, what do you think is most important about the lumbering era? Well, besides the economic activity, which really got Muskegon started as a, as a community and a county, mm -hmm. to me what's important is that, that this vast economic opportunity created jobs and brought people into the county. Mm -hmm. And so we have a huge wave of immigration coming in for this business. Mm -hmm. And this is where we see primarily northern Europeans. We see mm -hmm. the Irish the Dutch, the Germans, the English, the Scots, mm -hmm. and it was the first major wave of people coming here to create homes mm -hmm. in Muskegon County. All right, John, what are we looking at now? Well, the lumbering era began to wind down in the 1890s. Certainly by 1895 it was done. Mm -hmm. Charles Hackley and some other businessmen uh, banded together and formed the Board of Trade to bring other businesses into mm -hmm. the community. Mm -hmm. Uh, businesses like uh, Alaska Refrigerator, which became Norge, uh, mm -hmm. Bennett Pump, Continental Motors, and so on. Mm -hmm. And these additional jobs in the community then created another wave of immigration. Mm -hmm. This time it would be uh, Southern Europeans, uh, mm -hmm. Italians, uh, a lot of people from uh, Central Europe, and uh, Jewish people from throughout Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. who are coming to escape the pogroms and the persecution that's going on. Mm -hmm. So this adds to the diversity of our community, mm -hmm. and again, it's because of this economic activity that's going on. Mm -hmm. The artifacts that we have in this case here, I'm very proud of. These are all things that were brought by people from the old country emigrating to the United States that ended up here in Muskegon County. And now we are definitely into the industrial era. In the 1930s and the 1940s, there became a huge need for uh, gray iron products. And again, going back to that natural history, mm -hmm. the fine sugar sand that we have throughout Muskegon County is one of the best molding mediums in the world. Mm -hmm. So we had all kinds of foundries uh, developing here along uh, the lake shore of uh, Muskegon Lake. Mm -hmm. And uh, when World War II came along, there was a huge increase in the need for tank treads and yeah. crankshafts and all those kinds of things. So once again, we begin importing labor. There's another immigration of people that come in. Mm -hmm. They were recruiting African Americans to come in and work in the factories, as well as they were recruiting uh, Mexican Americans to come up because there was such a crushing need to keep these foundries working 24 hours and a day. A lot of the war. local men had yeah. gone off to war. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And so that, that increased labor need, based on our natural resources, mm -hmm. once again adds to the diversity of our community and strengthens it with, with that labor pool. History has absolutely shaped what we are today. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. It defines who we are and how we meld together. And even to this day, aside from industry, agriculture, it, they make up our top two industries in the area. That's correct. Uh, throughout the state of Michigan, agriculture is the second largest industry. It's second only to uh, the, the car industry. Mm -hmm. And this creates a need for labor. And so we've had a number of uh, primarily Mexican-Americans who have come up to this area. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of them have decided to stay and live in this region and make it uh, uh, their home mm -hmm. and become our neighbors and our friends. Mm -hmm. Well, that has been quite a tour, John. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, Sean, I'd like to thank you and mm -hmm. uh, Muskegon Community College for coming to uh, visit us today mm -hmm. and to, uh, to help uh, let the public know about what it is we offer. Mm -hmm. I'd remind you that what we've done today is just walk through the main building. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd mention again, we have yes. the Hackley and Hume Historic Site. We have the Skolnick House, uh, the Depression Era, we have the Fire Barn, we have thousands of educational programs. We've just barely scratched the surface today. So I would invite everyone out there that's watching to go to our website, lakeshoremuseum.org, take a look at our offerings, our special programs, our special exhibits, the wealth of educational opportunities that we have, and then come on down and take a look, see for yourselves. Well, thank you, John. Sean, thank you. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Absolutely. I've been speaking with uh, John McGarry, CEO of the Lakeshore Museum Center. This has been Muskegon in Motion, and I'm Sean Mullally. <laughs>